So um, here what I'm talking about today uh, is living in a relational world. Uh, and really what this is is about apologizing for uh, the state of the relational database because, you know, obviously with a lot of different new solutions coming out, we might have some stuff to apologize for. So relational data, what does it mean to relate? I mean, here you are, somewhere here, we're here, right there. Well, that relates to something, right? It's in the big smattering amount of data. It's not entirely useful, maybe if you get lost, very lost. On the other hand, when we go the opposite direction, we say, well, let's not actually care at all. Um, well, we end up with something like this. Uh, my office isn't quite this bad, but I'm sure someone in the uh, audience can probably attest to this. We know, every, we know where everything is. Um, please don't touch. We start touching stuff, you know, we'll never find that exact VT220 terminal in the left-hand corner. So one of the big problems here is that when we talk about relational databases, what's really come down to it is we've really gotten ourselves locked into this concept that a relational database is what? It's an SQL database. That's the way we say relational and suddenly we're uh, in the SQL world. And the relational database, this is essentially it. When we look at it, it's got something like a SQL parser. That's, you know, let's give a nice uh, hand to a fairly difficult language. It has a join optimizer. That's something when you start talking about inners and outers and people start getting headaches. And at some point in there, we have something called storage. At the very bottom of this, we talk about how we actually store data when we're done. Um, and we talk a lot about, you know, SANS and NASs and what can we do. And that's pretty much the thing. So first thing to begin, SQL sucks. Relational gets a bad name um, because of actual SQL. Everybody who has ever written an SQL database, anybody who's ever looked at an SQL parser, scratches their head and says, oh my god, what kind of committee came up with this? Because really, like, as soon as I put that on the screen right there, I saw members of the audience all leap back a little bit. You've seen this in your workplace. You've probably seen worse. This was the most I could get onto a screen that might terrify you. But the truth is, well, that's because I wanted a large font. It could be much larger. We could use a tiny font and fill the entire screen. This stuff happens. It's really hard for humans to sit there and read this kind of stuff. And some of what, you know, we hear feedback now is, well, this is way too complicated. We don't need this. You know, what a lot of people say is, well, you know, really, what I've got is I've got this key. You know, I've got your name. Um, I want that, and I want to go fetch an object out of a database based on your name. Well, that's great. That's a really simple access pattern. Um, but once you've got my name and you've got a piece of data, what are you actually going to do with that piece of data? I mean, are you just going to display my name? Are you just going to display one item that is representative of everything that is connected back to me? I remember hearing once that, you know, one lookup on uh, Facebook was, what, 72 lookups in Memcached at one point. Obviously, we've got a lot of data, and that, that data has to relate to go back and build things. And, you know, we can then say, well, we just have a little simple access pattern. I just want some key, but also with this some key, I want a width on it, just a simple width. Uh, you know, I want your name and I want your address book, or I want your mail. And this simple access pattern, okay, it looks pretty good right now. We're, we're in there, we've got it, we've got this key and we've got this next key. The problem is, it gets a little worse. Here's what happens. Anybody in the room who's ever written an API can, sees what the following happens. You have this great idea. You go out and you say, okay, I want this thing with this one key. And then somebody else comes back and they say, well, can I get that key? And I'd like that key back, but I'm gonna need a few keys. And can you actually sort that data? And you're like, no problem. I'll add another API call. Great. Then somebody else comes back. Well, yeah, well, I, I need to do something called a roll up. And you kind of scratch your head and you're like, uh, roll up? Uh, okay, let me look that up. Let me go write some more code. We have some more APIs. Let's keep going. And then, of course, you know, they're going to want to order that too. Have you ever thought about what would happen if we didn't actually have SQL? How many API calls we would need? How much flexibility? SQL sucks. On the other hand, think about how much more it would suck to learn thousands and thousands of API calls. If anybody can remember the day and age of like, you know, VMS or back when we would get giant walls of books, and I mean walls of books, you would go up to it, you would hope the, you know, you'd pull some book out of the thing, it'd be wedged in with some other book, and you hope you didn't drop three other books on your head, and you'd start spreading them out on the ground. Lots and lots of API calls are not really the answer at all. And really, a part of this has to do with what? Prepared statements. Prepared statements were supposed to be this concept. So we're going to take this SQL 
and we're going to take it, and then we're going to hand you back something that you're going to then execute on that you're going to be able to use. Well, the problem is we never really made a great leap in the language. Everyone who uses prepared statements today, well, they sort of use them under the, hun under the hood. Sometimes your drivers use them. Sometimes your drivers don't use them. Sometimes your drivers fake them. And in the end, depending on the database, if you've got this whole idea of this executable piece of code, it might not even run correctly every time it goes by because your data is actually changing. So prepared statements, our answer to the API, really haven't been that very successful either. Search, well, context, please. I was trying to create a slide for this talk, and I wanted to you know, talk about the Reddit development model. The problem is, is that I couldn't go on to Reddit and actually search for anything that would give me the Reddit development model. I wanted to type, you know, give me what is you know, the hot databases. And that you know, would give me a thing saying, hey, this is what people, databases people are using today. Except it kept coming back with random things. They would change over time. Without some more context, search, not incredibly useful. Of course, the answer to uh, some of these questions we've been hearing is things like, hey, new SQL. Let's go with new SQL. That'll be the solution to this. If only MySQL, if only we were, we were working on MySQL had we thought of the concept of a new SQL. So instead of saying, we just didn't implement the standard, if we could have said, well, it's new SQL, it's a lot better. I don't know. Might have went over, might not have went over. I have my doubts. Um, SQL is there as a standard in part because one person learns it, the next person picks it up and moves on with it. Truth is, you know, we look at things about SQL, most developers never learn anything beyond SQL 92. That's that standard that was written quite some time ago. Selects, inserts, updates, deletes. Beyond that, the database vendors have at this point, well, we've, never, we've liked nothing more than feature creep. If you look in the SQL standard, there's all kinds of stuff about object orientation, um, all can creation about user-defined functions, user-defined types, and all of this stuff. And the fact is, is that the majority of the world never actually used it. A big failure of us in the relational database world has been why? We've actually gone beyond just, hey, work on this relationship stuff, and we try to keep cramming feature and feature into these things. Um, so the truth is, schema sucks. It sucks to actually have a schema. Why does it suck to have a schema? Who has sit in a meeting and had seen one of these? Yeah, okay, and people who sit in a meeting, how many times have you had to create this thing called version ID inside your schema? At some point you put a version ID because you're, well, you're trying to say, well, we need to know what the version of the schema is because we may be modifying it. This diagram, these options, this pretty much sucks. Somebody was a god, sat there, drew this all out, told you how your data map is gonna work, probably didn't think about performance all that much, how stuff interrelated, and the thing is, is that it's firmly stuck. You do it, you create it, and then next time you want to do an update to it, they have to talk to you about, well, we're going to need downtime, and oh, we got this operational thing. Modifying schemas online, that's been, the, been one of those goals. Everybody's like, well, hey, let's go take the recurrent database. This will make relational database so much simpler if we modify schemas online. Read the fine print. Every time we find a database vendor who implements these, trade-offs, suddenly we have to put version information per row. Well, if we start sticking version information per row in, the, in our database, what do people do? They scream, oh my God, it's four more bytes in the row. What am I gonna do? Um, same thing happens if you start storing keys. But the problem is, when you actually start storing a lot of data, think about this, a lot of data, the four bytes might actually start mattering. The eight bytes might start mattering when you have metadata, especially when you start doing keys. You know, we talk about things like document databases. We talk about storing da data in, you know, serialized JSON forms, and we talk about thrift and all these things. But the truth is, every modern database we know about today is essentially the same thing. It's got some kind of row, it's got some variable content, unless it's entirely fixed, pretty rare nowadays, and it's all about storing those documents, tuples, whatever you wanna call about it. That's it. Do we have constraints on it? Do we not have constraints on it? You know, the database, in many ways, we came up with the blob. The blob was supposed to be an answer to many people's problems. People are like, well, I've got this data and it doesn't really fit and I wanna put it in here and let's just have this blob. Well, the blob itself. The blob is kinda schemaless if you think about it. It's really schemaless. You can put anything into it. We've seen people serialize anything, Perl code, uh, images. It doesn't really matter. It goes all in the same row. It goes all in the same column, in the same database. The problems are blobs suck. They're opaque. They're constraintless. They're too schemaless. There was a database a long time ago. That database was long got up by, bought up by IBM. 
what it did is it spent some time on a thing called a data blade. Their idea was we're going to put blobs in the database, and what we're then going to do is we're going to write tools that run in the database that sit there and can chew this stuff up so we can have these data structures that we can access in the database. And what happened? It turns out that when you start putting structureless data in a database, well, it blows up a lot. So what did they go down on? Their data blades. Their data blades would hit some piece of blob that wouldn't be quite right. It would blow up inside the database. This goes on and on. We've seen the same things with you know, stored procedures and so forth. You know, somebody's asked me once before, you know, why is it that Postgres can have Perl run inside the database? You know, why couldn't you actually have MySQL do that in the, in the same way? Well, the answer is Perl, I'm sorry, uh, Postgres, forked application. It can handle it. If one of, it, if one of, its, uh, one of its processes blow up, it's fine. It can keep moving most of the time. Sometimes the log gets stuck, sometimes it doesn't. But the question is, do you really want to have things that are inside your database constantly blowing apart and hoping everything turns out right? So blobs, they're opaque, constraintless, not so awesome. Another real problem we see, actually, is the interface issue. This is a little thing that, like, people scratch, like, okay, so what do you mean by that? Like, what are we doing? Well, we have to get data to the database, so we have to come up with some way of serializing this data. So, hey, it's great, let's send JSON over into the database. Well, the thing is, is that the major relational databases, all of them have protocol, their protocols are fast. They're very, very fast. They've spent years at this point of trying to figure out how do I get bytes across network safely that's not going to be corrupted onto the other side without escaping it, without putting it in human readable format. How do we get that data across to the other side? Now, the thing that is is that they're very proprietary. This is a big failure of the relational database vendors. We haven't been able to make things interop. Even though we have SQL, here's a standard. That standard ends immediately when suddenly we transform to this something that goes onto a wire and gets sent across. There's no way that the drivers from one database are going to talk to a driver, you know, talk to another database. We don't have standardized protocols. But the thing is, we could have moved to REST. It looks beautiful, but REST is really slow. Um, if you're trying to pump data back and forth really fast, one of the things you'll end up dumping is REST. REST is hard to parse. Um, it's fat. It doesn't, it doesn't work that well in the end. REST is really slow. On the other hand, proprietary, kind of fast. The other things people throw up, hey, aren't transactions actually slow? Well, they can be slow if they're very large. But the question sometimes we get back when we see this stuff, people will put up these benchmarks and will say, well, relational databases are too slow. They're entirely too slow. It's all because of transactions. So the thing that you got to ask yourself is, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter what kind of database you have. If the database is storing data in a binary format, think about it. It's serializing in a binary format, and it's sending to disk. It's all about the same in the end. So if you've got something that is really fast, much faster than anything else you see, in fact, it's much faster than anything else that, you know, sits there and about the, on average, it's about the same as everything else, you should ask yourself, really, are some things good too good to be true? This comes back up occasionally. People get really excited about, well, I found this solution. It was really fast, and we were storing data. And then you ask yourself, well, does your machine ever crash? Is sync ever being called? Because in the end of the day, all, of, all the databases are about peer-to-peer. -peer. We all have about the same tricks. We all learn how to actually store data. We know how to group it up and actually sync it at the same time. And in the end, it's all about the same speed. We don't make disks any much faster. Disks occasionally make themselves faster by lying to us. But the truth is the databases are all storing data pretty about the same way. So if you think your database is suddenly like two to three times faster than any other major vendor, you nearly really need to stop and ask yourself, what's going on? Because you know, disks are only so fast. Something is up. Um, and really, the question you also have to ask you know, do your users really value their data? Does it matter? Um, I had a question uh, years ago when I was visiting a bank, and I was, got to see some of their operations. And I noticed that, like, they weighed coins really quickly. Like, they would take incoming coin, they'd weigh it, and move the coin on. So, and I was wondering, like, is that really very accurate to weigh a bunch of metal and figure out money from it? I mean, I, I've got lint all over my coins. Do you, like, wash that stuff? What do you do with it? And the answer was, no, it's not completely accurate. Banks lose pennies, they lose dimes, they lose quarters. What do they do? They pay for it. 
they actually just pay for the fact that they have some loss. To actually fully take all that data, to, you know, to find all that stuff, well, it would be super expensive to do that. They lose data. You should be asking yourself, when you're losing data, does data matter? It might matter. Last year, I was uh, here at Oscon. I found this restaurant, had dinner with some friends, got total food poison. I got nice, you know, entered it into my favorite location system. Uh, about three days later, friends of mine said, oh, yeah, we were going to avoid that. Oh, that's a great plan. But then we then all looked back and found out that the history was gone. We have no idea what restaurant it was that I got food poisoning at. I mean, I kind of know it's a little bit off Burnside. It smells pretty bad. Beyond that, can't tell you. But it's gone. Now, that data is kind of valuable to me. I would like to know that. I wouldn't mind passing that on to other people. But hey, it's gone. So really, to me as a user, my data did matter. Serializing data, you know, we talk about the hu human need to read data. You know, a lot of time, do humans need to read things? We show that like, hey, we've got this uh, JSON format here. We have this other format here, and we can read that. The only time we really need to read that is what? When we're debugging it. You don't really need to read the on-disk format. If you do, use special tools, and you're a developer of the product. You're not actually an end user. An end user doesn't care about what goes across the wire. They care that their application works. They care that their data stored. These actual formats don't matter. You don't really matter. Indexes are a pain. The relational database, God, we've made things bad with indexes. Index require planning. Indexes aren't even in the SQL standard. They're not there. They don't actually exist. The reason why they exist, we can't make things fast without them. We just can't build stuff with them without them. We have to do it. And the fact is, to this day, humans can figure that out better, because you know your access pattern better than we do. Ah, but we do have MapReduce if we really want to. So what we do is we say, you know, screw indexes. We're going to throw lots of computers at the problem. Sometimes that's a good answer. The problem is when you continue to do it over and over again, you're not only throwing computers, you're actually throwing humans at it. Because some human has to rewrite that code and rewrite that code and rewrite that code and go back and forth through it. Not always the greatest. So do we have anything to look forward to? You know, right now in the open source world and relational databases, we've got a few things, but it's not really super exciting at the moment. Um, I'd like to actually see more stuff happening. There's a few things that I can actually see happening. Postgres has been extending its arrays pipe. That's interesting. That's going to get some, buy some people some time. It's not schemaless. It's going to actually do some stuff. You know, we look at, like, how do we transport data and easy access to single data. MySQL's put up a binary that actually shows them having a memcached port. Um, some folks over in Japan have written handler socket, trying to get away from the, do we necessarily need SQL to access every piece of data? In Drizzle, we have something, too. We have blob, we have blob streaming as well. In Drizzle, we built, we've started building everything uh, using Google's protobuffer internally. Um, we're pretty schemaless internally, it turns out. We don't entirely know how to make that work on the language side yet. Very hard to figure that out. And we're doing things like multi-masters so that we can actually take large shards of data, place them back into single masters, and do a reportings. MariaDB has been looking into virtual columns. Here's a few things that are going on. But right now, in the relational world, in the open source world, that's about it of what we've got. So at the moment, we have a lot to apologize for We have, in the relational, in the SQL database world. What have we done? We've created a language that is pretty much infinitely flexible and a pain in the ass. Um, you know, we've created proprietary protocols that you're not going to be able to read, but they're actually faster, and probably whoever's writing pages on the other side of these things, they, they don't actually really care. So a few more things like that. I think I've uh, run through my time, but that's a few of our apologies. Thanks very much.